Hi, welcome back. Uh, please join me in welcoming Francisco Passos, uh, who is from Google. Uh, he's a software engineer having 15 years of extensive experience in building productive uh, and efficient uh, software. Uh, he'll be discussing about migrating code bases, having uh, millions of modules from Python 2 to Python 3. And uh, he'll be also taking the inference from the work that has been done by his team and him uh, in Google for creating the tools around the same. He has previously worked on Google Maps, uh, Mail, Cloud, and Search Infrastructure. And uh, he is also keen in risk detection uh, for the international trade. So please welcome Francisco. So welcome everyone, thank you for attending. Uh, my name is Francisco, I work for Google. Thank you for the introduction. Um, I'll be telling you today about how we're migrating to Python 3. Uh, along the way, I hope that I can share some ideas that may be useful to you uh, at your scale. Now, fair warning, Google is not normal scale, so some of these tips may generalize well, uh, and, and I expect that they will, but not all of them will, for sure. And so please apply generous amounts of common sense. We all know that sometimes we end up doing things just because Google or, or any other big company does it, and that's definitely not going to apply here. But for some things, yeah, maybe. So. Take your pick. All right, so establishing context. Uh, Google works uh, in, we code into a monorepo, uh, a very large, colossal monorepo, but on monorepo all the same. And we build and test using um, Blaze. If you, you may know Basil, Basil is an open source uh, build system and uh, that, we, that we open sourced and Blaze is a superset of it. It's basically so that it can actually tie in with our, you know, building infrastructure. Um, so our support internally for Python 2 um, is limited and it's, uh, it's going away uh, within a short time frame. Um, and, and it's kind of unrealistic to actually expect to migrate everything centrally because there's a lot of Python modules. Um, the code of individual teams is moving really fast. So even if we were to try and start f migrating a bit of code today and finish it within a week or so, maybe that's a bit of code that is receiving a lot of intensive attention and it may be hard to actually catch up and have to do with a lot of, uh, of conflicts. Um, code ownership changes. At this scale, code ownership changes. Teams sometimes die and their code needs to be inherited or a team gets defragged to another location or a team gets absorbed into another organization. And so the ownership of code actually does change. Um, no individual piece of code changes hands often, but at this scale, there's always things changing, like daily. And some assumptions of the code can be very quirky. In some places you'll have C++ integrations. Uh, this is not the norm, but it does happen. And the, the fundamental remains, which is domain specific code is hard to, to migrate for someone who does not have uh, intrinsic knowledge. So this is always going to be something that is going to be easier for the code owners to actually migrate. Now that's not to say that you can't drive things centrally and you should, we'll talk about that. So coming into this, we have this problem. We have way too much work. We have too little structure. Like we, one, we don't know if this is feasible. Two, at some point, some people are going to have to make a call, do we need this? And some people are going to have to, to figure out how to plan it and figure out where to start. And, and which is my bit? Which part do I work on? It's, it's not exactly clear if, if something is mine to own because we're all cutting into the same repo. Sure, there's folders, but that's not the entire story because you can contribute code to pretty much any other folder so long as the owners accept it. And so there's this cooperative uh, climate that makes a, a change of this scale not easy to approach. There's also things like something has effectively gone unowned because the team that owned it really doesn't own it anymore. I mean, they still own it on paper, but they don't do it uh, in practice. And it's primarily contributor based. The, the users who still use it actually are the people who are maintaining it. So now what's going to happen? And this is, this is tough. And it's very easy to, at this point, to get overwhelmed by the lines of code, by the number of modules, by the number of changes you predict you need to do, by the complicated dependency tree that you, you're going to have. Um, and by the number of people involved. This is approachable. Let's talk about mechanical transformations first. This is the a tiny tip of your dependency tree. Uh, so let's say, let's say that you have 
this reflects only the Python 2 li uh, library dependencies. The key, core, the key concept here is you're going to want to avoid making, forcing a bulk migration. You can't bulk migrate a thousand, I mean, you shouldn't bulk migrate a thousand modules at the same time. You're going to have to do this piecemeal. In order for you to do that, you're going to have to individually pick at each of the modules that you can work on and make them Python 2 and Python 3 compatible simultaneously. If you can do that, then you can actually unblock further work. Um, it also means that you can also detect regressions because if you break a library for one of the sites, so for Python 2, you'll break a bunch of binaries that are already executing in Python, that are still executing in Python 2. If you break it for Python 3, you're going to break a bunch of binaries for Python 3. So you can actually detect regressions and make sure that things keep going. So at this point, let's say you actually know your dependency graph and these the lib1, lib2, and lib3, they are the leaves of your uh, Python 2 depend dependency graph. It means they have no Python 2 dependencies themselves. They are dependent on, they do, but they do not depend on Python 2 libraries. So as leaves that they are, they are unblocked. So you can actually go and work on them. And you find these targets that you can work on. And then you work on them individually. You change the code. You make whatever changes you need to do to ensure that this code will now work well, both in Python 2 and Python 3. Once you've done that, you haven't blocked work on the libraries that are depending on those. Now, notice that even if you're still uh, executing binaries that are running Python 2, this is going to be fine because lib4 and lib5 import all of those libraries and they are still supposed to work well for Python 2. Um, but importantly, at this point, lib4 and lib5 have become unblocked in your Python 2 dependency graph. They are now leaves in that dependency graph. And so now you can actually work on them. If you imagine that in this case, lib1, lib2, and lib3 belong to your team, lib4 belongs to another team, and lib5 become, belongs to another team, now both of the, those teams can be working in parallel. And now they have uh, leaves that they can work on, because until now they couldn't. So there, there's a bit of, um, of an unblocking effect here. You keep going, right, until you're done. Um, at some point, you reach an entry point, a binary. Uh, basically a module that is a, an entry point module and that decide, that you need to tell your build system this is supposed to run in Python 2 or Python 3. And if all of its dependencies are Python 3 compliant, then you can actually switch it. And that one is done. You don't need to go back. Um, it is rather interesting that... Um, hmm. So one thing we found is that it's, it's if you have a number of unblocked targets to work on, you can actually be smart about it. You can figure out which is the one that is blocking most people and work on that one first. And that is actually the one that is going to work best to the advantage of your, of your organization. Now, there's an interesting idea we wanted to share with you, which is, and if that's definitely this is not for, for the small code bases, but if you have a large code base with a lot of teams and there's not a lot of buy-in into uh, actually affecting the migration, you may actually uh, benefit from a mechanism to prevent backsliding. So basically you could, we tried, and it actually, to a degree, it worked for us. We introduced an allow list saying, your modules are going to stop working if you're running in Python 2 from this date, unless you actually enter this allow list, and then you have more time to actually work on your migration. But in order to enter the allow list, you have to commit uh, via an issue on a bug tracker or which, whichever way you want, you have to commit to a plan, to a timeline, to, to a mechanism that actually gets you there. Um, and so uh, that is actually a powerful push because it could also drive people to just go like, you know what, we kind of have been thinking about dropping this, this module entirely and replace the usage with this other newfangled thing, which is compliant. So regarding mechanical transformations, uh, there's some um, pieces of uh, open source tooling that can be incredibly valuable. So the first concept to know is if you have tests and you definitely should have tests and if you don't, you probably should create them because it's going to be very hard to be confident that your code base is going to work. Um, if that sounds really expensive, not being able to, to verify that hundreds and thousands and tens of thousands of modules are actually working is far more expensive if they reach production in a non-working state. It, it would be absolutely chaotic. It, it would be untenable. So we could not afford that. Um, for the most part, we have tests and where we didn't, we created a bunch. Um, 
So the notion of once, if you have tests, once you have tests, uh, you can actually run them both in Python 2 and in Python 3. And if they both run, I mean, that gives you no solid strong guarantee, but it gives you some guarantee. It's much better than nothing because as a dynamic language, you're not going to know unless you run it. Um, uh, definitely um, consider using modernize before you even do anything else. That's, we've realized that modernize is such a solid tool. Most of our automated changes begin with running modernize and then we go and we, we hack at the rest of it. And importantly, PyType, MyPy, any, any, type, uh, uh, any kind of type checking that you can throw at it may actually be very useful, even before you migrate. Because um, it may find individual type violations that you have in your Python 2 code. And if that might work accidentally in Python 2, and it will break in Python 3. So getting, getting your types actually um, intentionally right uh, means that by the time you get to migrate to three, you, you are, you're in, in better shape because if you need to revert and you go back to a two that is solid, it, it's just good form all around. If you can get away with that, then definitely consider that. Um, all right, now, instrumentation. We've, we've talked about uh, what you exactly need to do mechanically, but the, que the main questions remain, where do you start? Um, so I'm going to tell you about something that is actually pretty costly. Um, but in order for you to leverage that dependency graph, you need to know the dependency graph. So you need to build it. You need to maintain it. You need to refresh it often, like once a day, maybe more than that. And you need to instrument it. You want to be able to use it to answer questions like, what did we already do? What, what do we still need to do? And um, here's the things that we can do, which ones are more relevant right now? And is this ours? Because then you can actually restrict. You look at the dependency graph that you own. And within that sub, sub graph, you can actually figure out um, what are my projects individual leaves? What are my projects individual um, bottlenecks? And so more questions that you want to, to be able to respond from there is, is this module Python 2 compatible, Python 3 compatible, or both? And from there, you want to ask more interesting questions like, how many things are blocking this module? I want to have this as fast as possible, but this is blocked on other things. How many different things are blocking it? Which ones are they? Should I, are they mine or are they in other teams' um, ownership um, contexts? And should I go talk to them? Should we actually be in conversations? Might it be that they are thinking of doing this later and I can actually jump ahead and go and fix it for them? Um, and at that point, you can actually ask, well, this is the one that I was mentioning, which are the leaves for me right now? Which are the, the, the Python 2 libraries that are unblocked that I can go migrate right now? Where are the bottlenecks? Like, which are the libraries that if I go and fix right now will unblock the most amount of work and will increase parallelization of, of work across my project or across the company? And then ideally you want to, to give people enough of a context to understand, is it simpler to just drop my dependency? Because if you know that migrating this library is going to be very, very costly, but it's going to take months until you can even properly test it because it depends on so many other things, maybe, maybe that other uh, module that you've been thinking about migrating to, but you never get the time, maybe, that, maybe doing that migration is actually um, less expensive, less costly. So, so you can look at it more critically because you look at what is the cost of bring the, bringing this along versus the cost of, uh, of dropping it because there's a cost in both and you can, you can try and put them on the scales. And so that can allow you to be strategic, right? Uh, you can figure out which are the business critical models either because they have really high business value um, or are on the, the delivery path for something that is really critical or because they have high reputational value or, you, oh yes, oh perfect, thank you. Um, or because you want to uh, focus on the things that will maximize the amount of, um, of work that can be done in parallel by your team or the rest of the company. Now, it is important to know about on the topic of bottleneck modules, there's, there's a fundamental set of libraries that your organization and pretty much any organization is going to rely upon 
for a big fraction of the code. And we, we ended up calling these core libraries. And your progress at the beginning of the, and this is especially important for, for PM type people that might be watching or, or higher than that. It, it's going to be the case that at the beginning of your migration, you're going to, it's going to look like it's not really making a lot of progress or it's definitely very slow. And the point is so many things are blocked by these bottleneck, bottleneck core modules that unless, until you actually fix the last one of those, it's going to be really tough to actually make any progress on measurably, uh, visibly tested and pass, passing tests modules um, in other pieces of the code base. So project tracking. Um, once you have all of that information, once you have all that instrumentation and all of your, um, uh, all of your data flowing and being regenerated, you can actually make a dashboard. You can make a dynamic dashboard. And bonus points if you make them, uh, if you make the dashboard filterable by individual projects or things like that. Because then what you can do is at a global level, you can see how far you've come. How far is our company uh, um, come in terms of doing our global Python 3 migration? Uh, project managers can actually track progress within their focused areas. Let's say you have product manager for a specific um, uh, product area for a specific set of projects, then you can actually go and have a look at that specific project. Within a team or within a project, you can track your individual progress there and figure out what you need to do there, how far you're coming, and, and effectively to your engineers, and I can state this for a fact, having this graph uh, refreshed at least daily for the progress of your team means you have a burn down. The yellow line is a burn down and the right, the, 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 red, the red line is how much you've accomplished. So uh, this is effectively gamifying by providing a positive feedback loop on the progress of these, these things. And we cannot underestimate the effect of psychological um, motivator, motivators here, right? Um, a lot of engineers will be intrinsically motivated to do this because they want to be on the, on the newfangled thing, but a lot of people will not be motivated in the same, in the same manner. So um, that's, yeah, that's something to keep in mind. Cool, more things about instrumentation. Something that we do on our dashboards is we provide fundamental things, fundamental information about individual uh, modules. We call them targets, but they're for all intents and purposes, they're modules. And so the idea is that you have two key pieces of information for the, your project, which is what is, what are the things that you can actually do right now? Your upgradable targets. And what, what are the things that you cannot do right now in your project? And what's blocking them, right? The other things are the relationship between your code base and the rest of the code base. So what is blocked by my code and what other code is blocking my code? So these are important things. We found these to be incredibly useful and uh, uh, I mean, it's, uh, I, we hope this, these work for you if you can uh, put them together. So centralizing is, is still an important thing. Now we've been talking about how centralizing kind of is not uh, uh, a technique that you can rely on to solve the entire problem, but it's still very important because you need to know where you're going. And you, at Google, we have a permanent de dedicated Python team and a dedicated migration team. But if you don't, which is totally reasonable, consider creating a subset of of, of your people that is dedicated to this. So you can have people that are setting the technical strategy, that are setting up the tooling, the instrumentation, uh, the mechanisms for blocking regressions, and that are both converting things where applicable. And in some places, if something is really highly strategic, they are hand migrating it. So we managed to actually migrate 30% of our modules centrally, either by using automation or by hand. And so th this also helped a lot because both migrating 30% of your code base means you're sending code for review to the owners and they actually get a lot of visibility. Oh, this is moving, we need to get going too. So at Google, we tend to approach program management problems as engineering problems. And uh, all that we've been discussing so far is how you actually establish a process that will work for you. Uh, so what this slide is about change management. If you have a change management team, if you have a change management team, you're probably going to want to engage them and actually pull them in to, to help wrangle this. Um, but mostly you're going to want to be available to educate the leaders so that they can actually establish a mandate. If, if you don't get this coming from the top, this is not going to happen. Uh, be prepared that they will ask 
very deliberate and very detailed estimate costs and pilots and planning. And that's a lot of hard work that you need to be prepared to do. Uh, on the other, uh, additional to that, uh, your team is going to need to be able to document everything and answer a lot of questions. You don't want anyone to stay blocked just because they don't know how to go from where they are. Now, you won't be able to scale that unless you write a lot, you create common conversion patterns, documentation, you have an FAQ, you have lots of pointers to the things that will un allow people to unblock themselves. Um, and also there's, there's some communication engineering. You don't want to over communicate. You want to be incredibly motivational when you, when you speak about this. Even if, if teams are coming in like six months late to, to the migration, you still want to, want to welcome them and say, this is a great time for you to start. And here's all that you need. Here's all the materials. Here's all of the tooling. Uh, go forth and let us know if you, if you get blocked. Uh, know that victory is possible. Um, because we have all of that, we can actually track our progress uh, globally. So this is actually our progress. Um, you, you may be wondering what are those blips over there, those uh, big bumps and ups, and ups and downs. Those are basically attempts at fixing a bunch of things that then introduce breakage that we could not catch by continuous integration, then rolling that back. The big jumps are uh, actually automation that went in and we bulk migrated a bunch of things. And along the way, but especially in this last mile here, you should expect to find a lot of very tricky code or a lot of very organizational complexity. Um, at that point, dedicated project management and uh, using the centralized team can actually be very, very useful. These are probably, well, they are the experts, right? And with that, uh, quick summary, try and drive as much as you can uh, centrally. Expect that you can't drive everything. So ensure that you uh, create whatever is necessary for other people to do it too. So bulk migrate what you can, um, create as much instrumentation, as much tracking as you can, make sure you have your leadership support in and your communications is settled and your incentives are done. Uh, try and prevent backslides if you can. And then make sure people can see what they've done, what they have left to do, and that they have the tooling and the documentation and the knowledge uh, to know what to do from that point on. And with that, thank you so much for attending. I don't know exactly if uh, there's questions, but I'll be happy to take them. Thanks, Francisco. That was quite a nice talk. Excellent work. Uh, we have Thank two you. questions. Uh, one is from Diago. He's asking, what are your projections towards completely migrating from Python 2 to Python 3? Uh, hmm. I'm not sure. <laughs> let, me, let me go with, we have a hard deadline. Uh, so we had a hard deadline for the for people to actually uh, enter the the white the the the, the allow list, uh, and that deadline has passed. So all of the targets that had not been migrated actually have a, a plan. We have mm -hmm. a, a, a line in the sand. We have another date by which everything should have been uh, should have been migrated. This is it's it's tricky business, and I'll tell you why. Even if you do get people to commit to a specific plan and say, by this date, we'll have it done. What if there are other teams that also need to commit, but they are depending on the, the, the libraries from the first team? That's hard, right? So if someone commits to, the, to one day before the, uh, the end of, of the, the deadline, the, the ultimate deadline, and then the other teams are, are left in the dumps, then that's not a good, a good experience. We're trying to actually figure that out. Uh, I'm not going to give you the date because the date is not, is not exactly relevant, but. Uh, but yeah, we, we expect to do it soon. Uh, and we're, we're kind of in, in good shape to do it. All right. So Andy has a question. How did you build your module dependency graph? Ah, cool. So uh, there is, uh, in terms of open source tooling, there's something called module graph, module graph that will actually inspect your dependency tree and do that for you. Now, I mentioned that we are using Blaze, which is a superset of Basil, and Basil has uh, querying and graphing, uh, graphing mechanisms. Uh, in our case, we did not even use, I mean, we do use that, yes. We use that to, to build, um, uh, well, Dremel, if, if you look up Dremel, uh, there's a, an open source paper on it, uh, an open paper on it. It's, it's a, a, a querying engine 
uh, query engine that we that Google built. And so basically, we export everything into into these tables that then we can literally query in SQL and do joins and, and do all, all sorts of things. So what you saw there in the graphs and also on the tables that, that I that I showed the headers of, those are basically literally SQL queries that, that we write that basically join targets against their dependencies and tries to figure out if they are if, if they have been seen to actually pass uh, Python 2 or Python 3 tests and things like that. All right. I think that answers the question. Uh, we have another question by Thomas as well as Matthew. How do you manage to have such a big code base placed in a repository? What are the challenges with respect to managing this code base of this, this much volume? Yeah, th that's, uh, that would be another talk. Um, and I should probably attend that talk. But uh, I will say it is, it is tricky. And, and for me, it was quite an adaptation even when I joined nine years ago, because not only are we in the single repository, we are all working off head. So if your module depends on another module that another team created, you don't depend on a version. You depend on head, which means uh, greenness is, a, is an important concept for us. You don't want to submit things that are broken. So the, the things like TDD, where you submit a broken, where you commit a broken test and then you fix it, that's fine if you do that locally. Just don't, please don't do it to the global repository because you're going to break somebody, somebody else and they're going to have a bad day. Fortunately, we have uh, pre-submit triggers that will actually avoid that happening. And, uh, and so, and so we will know this. We we will not even, for the most part, we can prevent breaking changes from going in. Uh, but you are correct. It's it's a it's a bit of a challenge. However, it comes. It, it's it's a trade-off. There's actually some some write-ups on this online, um, on on the benefits that you get from not having things like branches. And so, while certain cases will actually benefit a lot from branching, the way that we conduct our project work. Uh, really does not lend itself to, to a lot of branching. So uh, staying on head simplifies release management and things like that. So there's, you know, it's a, it's a give and take. It's it's a trade-off. It's definitely not a common trade-off. So I take your point. It's it's not an easy thing. Right. Uh, we have time for more questions if anybody is interested to ask. Else, uh, you may please join uh, my creating Python two to three breakout channel in the Brian track. I'm there, so I'll see you there. Yep. Thanks a lot for joining. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.